My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the, the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. In this presentation, we'll discuss the uh, characters used in the identification of mealybugs. It's a family Pseudococcidae. First, we'll start with uh, a plate showing uh, the habitus or uh, life uh, characters of, of, of various types of mealybugs just to show what a diversity of, of, of shape and wax production is found within this family. Uh, one of the signal features of mealybugs is the presence of wax of various types. For instance, in this long-tailed mealybug, we have a mealy type of wax covering the body and then tendrils of wax along the lateral surface. Uh, very fluffy wax here in this species. Wax formed into more compact plates, like down here. And very fluffy wax with long projecting pencils of a glassy wax here. Characters that we'll discuss in this morphology section are responsible for making this diversity of wax. As with other groups, the diagnosis is ideally going to start with the preparation of a well-made slide in comparison to uh, line art illustrations that occur in the key uh, or diagnosis or description part of, of literature. An ideal prepared specimen was going to be dorsoventrally flattened. We'll have stained it for contrast so we can see the relevant characters. And we'll need around two to four hundred X in magnification in order to see most of these characters. What we'll be comparing it to, the line art illustration, is presented in the standard format. The outline of the insect uh, uh, is broken into a left and a right half. Characters that are found on the dorsal surface of the mealybug are, found, uh, are, are drawn on the left surface, uh, the left side of the illustration. And characters that are found on the ventral surface of the mealybug are drawn on the right, sur uh, right side of the image. The micromorphology features and specific structures that you need to compare are illustrated as call-out images, uh, usually uh, with a line indicating where they're to be found on the body. This is a generalized dictionary, uh, so to speak, of, of some of the more common morphology terms that are found in mealybug taxonomy. Uh, the antennae, osteoles, circulus, vulva, spiracles, serrari, anal bar, and anal ring, they're not always present in every specimen, are collectively some of the most important characters that you'll find uh, in keys and diagnoses. This slide shows representative line art illustrations used in common descriptions and diagnoses. For instance, these are illustrations of uh, the detail of the osteoles, which are structures found on the dorsal surface of the mealybug. They can be either anterior or posterior or both in their distribution and are presented as a a pair of lip-like structures that are a bit more sclerotized with a distribution of pores around them. And they're important landmarks that help you gain uh, a foothold on other aspects of morphology. A diversity of pore types are found and the exact uh, uh, type and distribution and in many cases count of these pores are taxonomically important as is the characterization of the duct types that are found uh, on the dorsum or ventral surface. The antennae are important, especially the number of segments. This is the structure known as the circulus, which is present in most species but is absent in some, and in some species is actually uh, present as two or more of these structures. It has a diversity of forms also. The legs are typically present and usually they're quite well developed with uh, most of the structure, most of the elements there from the coxa, coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, tarsus, and claw. So we'll start with the antenna. The number of segments is usually consistent at the species level. Uh, this is not always the case. Uh, there's population level variation. Uh, sometimes they can be damaged and you might be missing a segment or so. Uh, but it is very variable amongst genera. So you take a genus that has characteristically uh, eight antennal segments for most of the species. Well, there may be a species in that genus has only seven. 
or one that has typically nine segments. There may be species here and there that have only eight. So we count from the first segment here. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those are all well demarked from one another. Sometimes there can be an issue when it comes to the eighth and ninth if present. If you can sometimes see a faint line there, then that might be a pseudo-articulation indicating the presence of a ninth segment, and that's taxonomically important. These are close-up uh, photographs of the circulus. As I indicated earlier, this is uh, present in most species of uh, mealybugs, uh, but it can be absent. And in some cases, I mentioned, there can be uh, two or more circuli in the specimen. They're found in the abdomen on the ventral surface uh, around segments three and four. And typically, they are circular or nearly circular in outline. Uh, this is an example of one where it's essentially just a circle. And here it is in an actual specimen. And occasionally, that circle or near circle structure will be di bisected by what's called the intersegmental line. This is actually a continuation of the abdominal segmental division, but in this case, it actually traverses the circulus itself. And in some cases, the shape of the circulus can be highly modified. For instance, this one where it's uh, got uh, very prominent lobes that may actually be quite significantly sclerotized. And this is what this picture corresponds to as a specimen. Still not clear exactly what um, functional property the circulus has. More detail of the morphology of the leg. The first segment that articulates with the body is the coxa. And often there's a prominent sclerotized rod called the coxal process uh, that is continuous with the body wall. Coxal process typically does not uh, uh, appear in, in much diagnostic work, uh, but occasionally it can have pores uh, on its surface that are important uh, to keep track of. The next segment is the trochanter, and then following that is the femur, the tibia, and the tarsus. At the end of the tarsus is a single claw, and in this illustration here, you get a very good close-up of the claw. On the inner curvature of the claw, in some species, there is a denticle or tooth. Um, there will be at most one of these denticles uh, in mealybugs. Um, and there are some genera in which the uh, denticle is present in some species and is absent in other species. It can be difficult sometimes to see the denticle. It can be quite small. Um, one way to look for it is to focus in and out on the claw edge and look for disruptions in the pattern of light around the middle section of the interior curvature of the claw. That might indicate the denticle is there. There are other structures you would see, too, in a close-up of the claw region. These are the digitules. Uh, these are long, modified, cetal-type structures that project either from the claw base itself, in which case it's a claw digitule, or from the tarsal segment, in which case it's a tarsal digitule. A character that's especially important as, uh, at species-level identification for mealybugs is whether translucent pores can be discerned on the leg segments. When present, these will be restricted to the third, uh, the third uh, pair of legs. And again, when present, will be present exclusively in adult females. They are not present in all specimens. And they may be regionally distributed on the coxa, less frequently on the trochanta, but frequently on the femur and tibia. And they are best visualized as uh, mostly circular, though not perfectly circular, clear spots. Uh, and again, focusing up and down on the tibia, femur, or whichever structure is the best way to sort of visualize these. A very prominent structure at the terminus of the abdomen is the anal ring. This is a plate showing how uh, diverse the morphology of this structure can be in its general shape, degree of sclerotization, uh, the manner in which these clear areas or cell-like structures are distributed, and the development of the CD. This is a digital image here. This species is Nipicoccus nippi. Uh, this structure does not typically feature in uh, 
uh, species level identification, but variation uh, in some cases can be important for discriminating certain genera. These are the bases for the anal ring CD here. So there's one, two, three, four that I can discern quite easily in this picture. And then these areolations here are cells. Other important characters in this region include the vulva and anal bar. The vulva is uh, restricted to the adult stage of the female and is the, uh, uh, the, the, the opening through which eggs or crawlers uh, are uh, uh, ejected. Um, it's present in well-prepared specimens uh, and is quite clear. And it mostly appears as a slit-like structure with surrounding cuticle uh, wrinkled and pleated. Very often it's surrounded by structures that are called vent, uh, trilocular pores and multilocular pores, and we'll discuss those in another slide, and also CD. So this is actually a character you should look for fairly early on in your examination of a specimen because its presence will uh, assure you that you're looking at an adult female. An anal bar is also taxonomically important, uh, at, certainly at the level of genus. It's a uh, sclera uh, heavily sclerotized rod-like structure in the anal lobe, which is here. And it's generally fairly, uh, fairly easily seen when it's present, though in some cases it can be obscured by other characters. So again, just to get your reference, this is the anal ring here, the anal lobe, anal bar. Slightly anterior to the anal ring is the vulva, the pleat-like structure, and the various pores distributed around it. I briefly mentioned osteoles a little earlier. Uh, if they're fully present, there will be an anterior pair that is just lateral to and anterior of the front legs and mouth parts. And occasionally, the posterior pair uh, will be missing, uh, but they are also lateral and just, uh, just in, uh, anterior to uh, the region of the vulva and the anus. Uh, they're fairly easy to recognize uh, when they are present. They form kind of a mound projecting out of the cuticle, uh, but they're paired. Each individual osteole is a paired structure. There's one lobe here, one lobe here, with a cavity or slit in between. And the margins of those two lobes are typically slightly more sclerotized with a concentration of these pore-like structures surrounding them. So here's the presence of an osteole uh, near the margin. And to show you that it's a margin, here's one of the serarian cetal structures called a serarius. <clears throat> Pores and ducts form some of the most important characters for uh, species level ID. These are responsible for the production of wax of different properties. There are numerous types of them. And they uh, can be important when they're restricted to certain parts of the body region. For instance, are they present or absent near the vulva? Are they restricted to the dorsal ventral surface? Or perhaps restricted uh, in a, of a specific type and restricted to near the base of the coccy? Uh, they may be present exclusively in the adult female stage. I mentioned that earlier for the translucent pores on the legs. Uh, but also multilocular pores. Multilocular pores are especially the ones around the vulva responsible for producing ovisac wax, so they're restricted to adult females. And species determined is uh, often based on a careful count of pores and ducts of the various types. For instance, there might be a species level discrimination between uh, a serarius that has 8 to 15 trilocular pores versus 25 to 35 trilocular pores. And again, these usually require 2 to 400 uh, X resolution for uh, uh, magnification for resolution. And here's a, uh, uh, a brief glossary of the terminology specific for pores and ducts. So now we'll go into a little bit more visual detail of, of various pore types. Uh, Multilocular pores here. Now they can be distributed on the dorsal surface or the ventral surface, uh, or restricted to a specific region of, of uh, typically the ventral region. The precise morphology can vary significantly, but they're always circular with a number of smaller chambers surrounding an open center. 
and each one of those chambers or locules is responsible for production of a strand of wax. The most common type of pore of the locular variety is the trilocular pore. These are essentially triangular in outline, though rounded, and they have a, what we call a swirled interior. Okay. Another type of pore uh, that's common in certain genera is the quinquilocular pore, or five-chambered pore. When present, these are usually present um, uh, primarily on the ventral surface. This is a good genus level character, but it is also employed at the species level as well. Uh, here's a close-up of, of multilocular pores, again with the open center and the evidence of the uh, loculation around the outer margin. And apart from the pores, the ducts are incredibly important. This is an illustration showing the form of, of several of the duct types. One of the most important is known as the oral rim. In this illustration, you can see that what you, what you will see from the surface is a washer-like structure of enhanced sclerotization here and an interior uh, area which corresponds to a projecting uh, tubule structure uh, with a glandular tip on the inside. So this is a tri this is a uh, oral rim duct of size one and size two, and in this case there is a discoidal pore, which is another pore type associated with it, and it is mixed in with a field of trilocular pores and CD. There is another markedly different duct type that is restricted to the genus Phariseae. So it's called the Phariseae type duct. It has a markedly elongated inner tubule region and a very heavily sclerotized rim surrounded by a, light, a, a, a less heavily sclerotized uh, margin. Associated with it are the, uh, in some cases, pores or CD with the cetal sockets here. And the arrangement and distribution of both the ducts and the CD and pores surrounding them are very important in this genus for species level ID. And then the third major type of duct is known as the oral collar. And this is the most common and widely distributed duct type uh, in uh, mealybugs. They resemble oral rims, except that they lack the sclerotized disc-like rim structure uh, on the cuticle. They're typically a little shorter, and they have uh, a slight sclerotization at both the opening uh, and inner end of it. And in this slide here, which is of uh, this image here, which is of the long-tailed mealybug, uh, we can see characteristically it will have one dominant oral rim duct and one or two smaller oral rim ducts in association with each sororius. We'll discuss the sororius in a moment, but this would be characteristic for the uh, species Pseudococcus longispinus. And then that brings us to CT and the specialized structure uh, known as sororian CT that form the structure known as a sororius. In this picture here, we have a sororius, uh, which is composed of the sororian CT here, coupled with an abundance of trilocular pores and auxiliary CD, which are just regular flagellate CD, um, as evidenced by the socket that they leave right here. The Sorarian CETA itself is a, uh, uh, a quite enlarged, very often uh, conical uh, wax secreting structure that's found usually in pairs or two or more um, in a cluster. What defines a sororius can be a little tricky, but typically it will be um, two of these sororian CD and at least some uh, trilocular pores uh, close by. And these will often be uh, distributed um, segmentally from the anal lobe uh, anterior to um, in front of the eyes. <coughs> There are also covering CD, uh, just sort of general cetal types that you'll find covering the body, and they can be uh, dorsal uh, and or ventral. Uh, their morphology can vary, but typically they're flagellate, 
and they also can vary in the density. For instance, there are some that are quite dense on the dorsum. For instance, the uh, uh, pink hibiscus mealybug, Machinellococcus hirsutus, hirsutus meaning hairy. There's another type of Ceta that's common in a genera like Phenococcus. Uh, it's called, it's, it's a flame-like flame -like enlarged Ceta. It's usually uh, quite a bit smaller than a Serrarian Ceta, um, but it has a slightly uh, swollen region just after, uh, just beyond the base of it, and then it then tapers, almost like a flame in shape. Occasionally, the Serrarian Ceta itself will break off but it will leave a prominent clear spot, which is the socket for it. So you should be able to count Sorari and Ceta even in instances where they're broken. And in some cases, they can be highly modified. Uh, for instance, in this species, they are truncate and forming a large cluster. This presentation also is a result of the collaboration of, of several individuals and their institutions, and they're listed on this slide. And at this point, I'll take any questions. Why don't we use molecular techniques for mealybug identification? We don't use, at this point anyway, molecular techniques for uh, primary identification of, of, of a specimen that might be of a regulatory uh, significance, um, primarily because it's not fast enough at this point. Uh, a a, a well-made slide can be accomplished in an hour or so, and a skilled identifier uh, with access to the literature should be able to make progress even on a very exotic, perhaps, specimen uh, fairly quickly. Um, this may change over time. Uh, there are other dif uh, difficulties as well. Um, for instance, uh, being able to identify the species level using uh, molecular techniques um, requires that beforehand you have some knowledge of, of the sequences, for instance, making primers to amplify, and they may not be available in all cases and that might slow down even further the process of, of using molecular tools for an ID. What is the purpose of using potassium hydroxide on mealybugs? Potassium hydroxide is used in the uh, clearing and mounting procedure for not just mealybugs but other scale insects. Uh, almost all of the characters that we use for diagnosis are found on the cuticle, uh, the exterior covering of the insect, and the interior body contents uh, basically get in the way of us being able to visualize those. So. Uh, Potassium hydroxide uh, warmed up is used to macerate those uh, fats uh, and proteins especially, dissolve them, and then they can be pumped out um, in distilled water or syringed out and then moved on to the next stages of slide mounting such as dehydration, staining, and then final mounting.